Okay, so today all we're going to do is a comprehension exercise, I'm still wearing the mic, is a comprehension exercise where um, we're going to look at a piece of writing by um, Graham, I can't remember his name now, Hancock, Graham Hancock, um, called Fingerprints of the Gods. Now the idea of this book is that you can find evidence of these godlike entities dotted all the way um, through Earth's history, through our archaeology, through our uh, stories, all that sort of stuff. And he refers to that as the fingerprints of the gods, or the evidence that these aliens left behind when they manufactured our planet, or when they colonized our world, or whatever you want to call it. Um, so he states in his book that um, he's found evidence of all of this. Now we're going to look at some of the uh, some of the paragraphs from the opening of this book. Now the book goes on to describe um, uh, Atlantis and then other pieces of technology that show a clear picture that something very strange happened on our planet. That's what he purports. Um, I'm going to read you a small excerpt of that today and the, um, the text document is also going to be on Google Classroom. So all you need to do is open that up. So go into that now, you'll be able to open it up and then follow along. Now, it starts in a very mundane way with uh, a piece of historical evidence and um, we're going to look at, I'll, I'll read it to you and I'll explain what all that means as we go along. Um, now he's a, he's a writer I respect, he used to be a political journalist, he moved on and um, did some investigation and was labelled by the mass media as a pseudo-scientist, although he never purported to be a scientist at all. Um, then he was able to do TED talks and he was able to get taken much more seriously. And he's one of the people who's taken very seriously now as um, a reputable source of information. Um, he's the kind of guy that went out to Egypt to look at the Great Pyramid and climbed it. He, he bribed some officials, um, got to the base of the pyramid and actually climbed to the top so that he could get a better perspective of what he was talking about. <clears throat> Gotta respect a man that breaks the law in a country where people are dumb and heavily armed. Um, just to make a point. So, He's a good writer, a good researcher, um, and he wrote this book, The Fingerprint of the Gods, and claimed to have found evidence of Atlantis. Um, so we're going to look at a piece of information from the, from the front of the book, the very beginning of the book, uh, the way the book opens, um, at the kind of evidence that he's found and the kind of evidence that, um, that he's uh, putting forward as proof that something very strange is happening on our planet and what we know of as um, accepted science is not all that there is. Okay, so I'm going to read the section from the, uh, from the book that I've uh, printed out. Well, I haven't printed it for you. I've given you as a, P, uh, as a doc dog. I'm reading it off of a PDF. Okay, so it starts. To Professor Charles Hapgood, uh, Keene College, Keene, New Hampshire. Uh, Dear Professor Hapgood, your request for evaluation of certain unusual features of the Piri Reese World Map of 1513 by this organization has been reviewed. The claim that the lower part of the map portrays the Princess Martha coast of Queen Maudland Antarctica and the Palmer Peninsula is reasonable. We find that this is the most logical and, in all probability, the correct interpretation of the map. The geographical details shown in the lower part of the map agrees very remarkably with the results of the seismic profile made across the top of the ice cap by the Swedish-British Antarctic Expedition of 1949. This indicates the coastline has been mapped before it was covered by the ice cap. The ice cap in this region is now about a mile thick. <clears throat> we have no idea how the data on this map can be reconciled with the supposed state of geographical knowledge in 1513. Harold Z. Olmeyer, Lieutenant Colonel, US Air Force Commander. So, what this is saying is that um, Professor Hapgood um, sent uh, a map, the Piri Reese map, which was uh, made up, well, which he claims was from 1513, um, which mapped the lower part of Antarctica. Um, now in 1949 they did a seismic survey using the current technology that obviously wasn't available in 1513, and they mapped um, part of Antarctica. Now the map, the Piri Reese map, matches that map perfectly, and there's no way that that could be possible because there's a, a mile, a good mile of ice resting on top. So the geographic details and um, the detailing on the map match perfectly and there's no way that that could have happened. And a US colonel um, states, yes, we agree, don't know how it happened, but your map matches this map. So how did a map from 1513 
match seismic surveys from 1949. <clears throat> I'll carry on. Despite the deadpan language, Olmeyer's letter is a bombshell. Certainly true. If Queen Maud Land was mapped before it was covered by ice, the original cartography must have been done an extraordinarily long time ago. How long ago exactly? Conventional wisdom has it that the Antarctic ice cap in its present extent and form is millions of years old, and that's something that we know from the Antarctic section in Grade 10. On closer examination, this notion turns out to be seriously flawed. So seriously that we need not assume that the map drawn by Admiral Piri Rees depicts Queen Maud Land as it looked millions of years in the past. The best recent evidence suggests that Queen Maud Land and the neighbouring regions shown on the map pass through a long ice-free period which may not have come um, completely to an end until about 6,000 years ago. 6,000 years ago. Now this changes everything we know about Antarctica. This evidence, which we shall touch upon again in the next chapter, liberates us from the burdensome task of explaining who or what had the technology to undertake an accurate geographical survey of Antarctica in, say, 2 million years BC, long before our own species came into existence. By the same token, since map making is a complex and civilized activity, it compels us to explain how such a task could have been accomplished even 6,000 years ago, well before the development of the first true civilized civilizations recognized by historians. So what we're saying is it's not possible that this map dates back millions of years. It's not possible. Uh, that's, that's long before our ancestors even began to uh, show up on Earth. So what we're saying is this map can at most have come from a few thousand years ago, which means that at that time, the ice didn't exist around Antarctica which means that everything we know about the past and everything that we're taught is wrong. In attempting that explanation, it is worth reminding ourselves of the basic historical and geographical facts. Number one, the Piri Reis map, which is a genuine document, document, not a hoax of any kind, was made at Constantinople in AD 1513. Number two, it focuses on the western coast of Africa, the eastern coast of South America, and the northern coast of Antarctica. Number three, Piri Reis, that's the Admiral, could not have acquired his information on this latter region from contemporary explorers because Antarctica remained undiscovered until AD 1818, four more than 300 years after he drew the map. Number four, the ice-free coast of Queen Maud Land, shown in the map, is, co is a colossal puzzle because of the geographical evidence confirms that the latest date it could have been surveyed and charted in ice-free condition is 4,000 years BC. Number five, it is not possible to pinpoint the earliest date that such a task could have been accomplished, but seems that the Queen Maud Land uh, literal, I don't know what that word means, may have remained in a stable, unglaciated condition for at least 9,000 years before the spreading ice cap swallowed it entirely. Number six, there is no civilization known to history that had the capacity or need to survey that coastline in the relevant period between 13,000 BC and 4,000 BC. So in other words, the true enigma of the 1513 map is not so much its inclusion of a continent not discovered until 1818, but its portrayal of part of the coastline of that continent under ice-free conditions, which came to an end 6,000 years ago and have not since recurred. Now how can this be explained? Piri Reis obligingly gives us this answer in a series of notes written in his own hand on the map itself. He tells us that he was not responsible for the original, original surveying and cartography. On the contrary, he admits that his role was merely that of compiler and copyist, and that the map was derived from a large number of source maps. Some of these have been drawn by contemporary or near-contemporary explorers, including uh, Christopher Columbus, who had by then reached South America and the Caribbean, but others uh, were documents dating back to the 4th century BC or earlier. So Piri Reis, uh, the Admiral of the Man, did not um, claim to have made this map. Instead, he collected other documents and put the map together. So although the map is credited to him, he only admits that he put it together from other people's documents, and some of them date back a long, a long way. Piri Reis did not venture any suggestion as to the identity of the cartographers who had produced the earlier maps. In 1963, however, 
Professor Hapgood proposed a novel and thought-provoking -provo solution to the problem. He argued that some of the source maps the Admiral had made use of, in particular those said to date back to the 4th century BC, had themselves been based on even older sources, which in turn had been based on sources originating in the furthest antiquity. There was, he asserted, irrefutable evidence that the Earth had been completely mapped before 4,000 years BC by a hitherto unknown and undiscovered civilization which had achieved a high level of technological advancement. From Alexandria, uh, Alexandria according to Hapgood's reconstruction, copies of these compilations and of some of the original source maps were transferred to other centers of learning, notably Constantinople. Finally, when Constantinople was seized by the Venetians during the Fourth Crusade in 1204, the maps began to find their way into the hands of European sailors and adventurers. And we have a quote. Most of these maps were of the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean and the Black Sea, but maps of other areas survived. These included maps of Americas and maps of the Arctic and Antarctic Oceans. It becomes clear that, that the ancient voyagers traveled from pole to pole. Unbelievable as it may appear, the evidence nevertheless indicates that some ancient people explored Antarctica when its coasts were free of ice. It is clear too that they had an instrument of navigation for accurately determining longitudes that was far superior to anything possessed by the peoples of ancient, medieval or modern times until the second half of the 18th century. The evidence of a lost technology will support and give credence to many of the other hypotheses that have been brought forward of a lost civilization in remote times. Scholars have been able to dismiss most of the evidence as mere myth, but here we have evidence that cannot be dismissed. The evidence requires that all the other evidence that has been brought forward in the past should be re-examined with an open mind. Despite a ringing endorsement from Albert Einstein, and despite the later admission of John Wright, president of the American Geographical Society, that Hapgood had posed hypotheses that cry aloud for further testing, no further scientific research has ever been undertaken into these anomalous early maps. Moreover, far from being applauded for making a serious new contribution to the debate about the antiquity of human civilization, Hapgood, until his death, was cold-shouldered by the majority of his professional peers, who couched their discussion of his works in what has accurately been described as thick and unwarranted sarcasm selecting trivial and uh, factors not subject to verification as the basis for condemnation, seeking in this way to avoid the basic issues. So in other words, Hapgood discovered these maps, these Piri Reis maps. Um, we found that they have unknown historical sources and um, he proposed that this couldn't be uh, reconciled with what we're teaching in schools today. And he suggested that we, uh, we take the pretty moderate step of doing some more serious investigation and um, other people agreed with him including Albert Einstein and John Wright the president of the American Geographical um, Society they agreed that uh, more testing and research must be done and all of this was buried and no research was ever done into the fact that the Piri Reis map um, existed uh, and you've probably never heard of it it's not being taught in schools it probably never will be taught in schools but this map shows Antarctica fairly recently not covered by ice. So it wasn't covered millions of years ago because there's no way those people could have mapped it if it was under ice. In fact, even today, it's difficult to get to it. We have to have special ships, special vehicles, special mapping technology. It's very, very difficult to even go there, let alone map the place, and certainly map it uh, with um, seismic technology. So how did they do that? Now, what the rest of the book goes on to uh, propose is that um, Atlantis may have been on Antarctica. It may have been um, a habitable place some 2,000 miles from where the pole was at that time. So it wasn't uninhabitable, it was relatively warm, um, and it was possible to support life there, to support human life. And that an ancient civilization may have made a base there, and um, that may have been where we see the stories of Atlantis. That may have been the base for what um, eventually became the legends of Atlantis. So that's one possibility. Now this comes from Fingerprints of the Gods. As I've said before, Graham Hancock went on to write another book where he moved that to another place. Now I'm gonna read that book um, by Monday and I'm gonna propose, I'm gonna present that, those facts and we'll come up with um, 
a more likely hypothesis based on all the information that we've got. Um, I'll also try and catch up with some more evidence if I get time to do it, but I'm, I'm trying to catch up with this as well. It's very difficult because I've got James. Um, so that's the section. Now there's going to be a, there is a quiz with some questions on that and there's some vocabulary for you to look up. Um, so go on to Google Class, uh, yeah, Google Classroom, sorry, half asleep. Go to Google Classroom, answer the questions, and um, I'll come back with the answers in a little while.